The heroic last stand of the Spartan King Leonidas and his 300 warriors, the Battle of Thermopylae is the stuff of legends. But would it make for a good war game? If all of the Spartans are killed, I mean, what's the point? Well, we found a person that was uniquely suited to help us answer this question. People ask me if I'm a war gamer, and the answer is yes. Mike Cole, author of The Bronze Lie, gives us his ideas on writing a successful war game scenario for the Battle of Thermopylae. War games are really useful ways to ask and answer strategic and tactical questions and can be a valuable model that, in concert with literary and archaeological and experimental archaeological sources, help you paint a complete picture of what happened. There's Mike Cole's take on the value of war gaming. Hey everyone, I'm back here in the game room. I wanted to talk to you today about the scenario that I wrote for the Little Wars TV video Thermopylae. Now originally we were going to do kind of a you know club on club throwdown which is a lot of fun. And if you're going to do that, why not do Thermopylae? It's totally epic, right? But in that battle, all the Spartans died, right? So how do you write a scenario where one side is wiped out? I mean, is that even really worth doing? Well, you know, many of you know, I've, I've written a lot of war game scenarios in my day. Uh, you probably played a bunch of them. Uh, and I always do a lot of research. So for this battle, I leaned on Herodotus, the original chronicler of the battle. Other than that, I visited the site a few years back with my wife, which gave me a sense of the landscape. But I felt like this wasn't quite enough to make a successful scenario. So what do I do? Well, I had an opportunity to interview Mike Cole, who wrote The Bronze Lie, which has a huge section on the Spartans at Thermopylae. And I decided it wouldn't be interesting to ask him how he would write the scenario and kind of base our scenario on Mike Cole's research. So here's the interview I did, and this is how I kind of pulled out from him how I built the scenario, which we're gonna call Mike Cole's Thermopylae. And first of all, I wanted to get a sense from him how did he see the action in general? Like what kind of a battle was it uh, as kind of a basis to start from? Here's what he said. The Battle of Thermopylae is seen by most people as a heroic suicide mission where 300 Spartans led by their king, following an oracle from Delphi that said a king must die or Sparta must be destroyed, fought a doomed holding action in a tiny little mountain pass, knowing they would all be destroyed as nonsense. It's like, there's no way you can look at the sources and come to that conclusion. Um, the reality is that Thermopylae was a disastrous defeat for the Greek coalition. It wasn't even one battle. It was an, a land action that was connected to the naval battle of Artemision, which it was not a suicide mission. It was not 300 men. It was 7,000 men. They had every expectation of being able to win by holding that pass, because when you consider the terrain, 7,000 men is more than enough to hold that um, incredible terrain. It's some of the best offensive terrain in the world. And their goal was not to defeat the Persians militarily, but to hold this massive force, probably about 100,000 men, which is massive by the standards of the ancient world. <clears throat> not, by the way, the millions of men that um, popular mythology would have us believe, um, and hold them there in position so that they would starve themselves, right? That mission to, with these 7,000 men to block them at Thermopylae and hold them there until they starve themselves out was a perfectly good plan and had every expectation of victory. It was not a suicide mission. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. But there's two things that jumped out to me as a scenario designer. First, Mike's take that this was not set up to be a heroic last stand. So he sees the Greeks going into this with an expectation of victory. So that gives me confidence to write a scenario from the beginning where the Greeks feel they can win, not just be wiped out. Second of all, he talks about the naval battle of Artemisium. Now that was interesting because if I could somehow include that, it might widen out the scenario and make it be just a little more interesting for the gamers. So I asked him to elaborate more on the naval battle at Artemisium. Biggest misconceptions about the Battle of Thermopylae is that it was one action. It wasn't. It was a joint action 
completely and inextricably linked to the naval battle of Artemision, which I've described as just being fought off the Gulf of Malice. These two battles need to be reckoned jointly. And let me give you an example. We know that Xerxes sent a fleet to circumvent Euboea. This is the island to Leonidas' north, ostensibly to pin the fleet in Artemision in place. But that path, if you look up the Europus Channel into the Malian Gulf, would have allowed Xerxes to have ships right on the north shore next to Leonidas' position. Now let me ask you, if you had ships in that position, would you maybe discharge marines on the shore right behind Leonidas? I know I would. If the storm had not blown in and wrecked that fleet attempting to circumnavigate Uboea, you would have seen Persian marines being discharged in Leonidas's rear, likely before the immortals, or maybe even at the exact same time as the immortals, descended from the heights. And that could have completely changed how the battle went. But all these examples I've just given show that these are linked battles. Now, when you're wargaming, you necessarily focus tactically, right? You're dialing that camera right in over the heads of the soldiers. And when you're doing that, it's hard to reckon them both um, together. So if I'm wargaming this, yeah, tactically, you're gonna have to fight these battles separately. But war games, as we know, are fought in three cameras usually. They're fought in tactical, right on top of the soldiers' heads. They're fought operationally. You're pulling back the camera, you're looking a little bit more at the theater of war. Or they're fought strategically, where you're dealing with the movements of entire armies and the fates of nations. Um, I think there's an argument to be made at the operational lens for Thermopylae and Artemision to be considered jointly. Okay, Marines landing in the Spartans' rear is something that I have never heard anyone consider before. So that has to go in the scenario because it is uniquely Mike Cole's version of this battle. Okay, I've added a rule where each turn the Persian player rolls two six-sided dice to see if the Persian Marines either land, are still sailing, or are sunk by a storm. Historically, they were sunk by a storm. Next up, I asked him about victory conditions. How do you win? If you're wargaming the Battle of Thermopylae, it's really important to think of it from the Greek perspective as a holding action. The Greek goal is not to defeat the Persians militarily. The goal is to fix this enormous army in place long enough that it essentially starves itself to death. Remember that ancient armies live off the land. They bring in harvests, they steal everything that's, that's not nailed down to feed their soldiers. And remember, this is one of the biggest armies in the known world at the time. It's, the Greeks don't have to defeat them militarily. They just have to hold them in place long enough that starvation, desertion, uh, angering the locals because they're taking their food and therefore having uh, you know, the locals respond and retaliate, that would be enough to demoralize and disable the Persian army. So according to Mike, the way to win is for the Greeks to stall the Persians for a certain amount of time, essentially running out the clock before the Persians starve. The Persians obviously need to beat that clock. So I've decided to represent this by having both the Greeks and the Persians accumulate victory points throughout the game. The side with the most points when the Persians capture the small hill will win. But the key is that the Greek player will receive one point for each turn until the small hill is captured. Once the Persians get the hill, they'll gain 10 points. This essentially gives the Persians 10 turns to win. Now both sides are also gaining points in the naval game, which will affect the outcome as well. Next, I asked Mike about creating an historical army list for the battle. When you're developing a war game, you need to know unit breakdowns, right? You need to know how many troops, how they're armed and equipped, how to classify them into infantry classes. Well, we have some great tools. And fortunately, Herodotus is really clear here. And I encourage wargamers to go back to Herodotus. And well, for the Greek side, we also need to consider Diodorus Siculus. As I said, for Herodotus, it's 300 Spartans. You learn in Diodorus, it's 1,000. We also have in both Diodorus and in Herodotus a breakdown of what the Greek contributions are. And I can tell you right now, mostly heavy infantry. We have almost no mention of cavalry. We have some description of light infantry, peltasts, and also wargamers should especially consider the Greek helots, the Spartan helots. This is the Spartan slave caste. 
who would have fought as light infantry, sometimes with rocks, sometimes with javelins, sometimes with scavenged weapons. But so there would have been at least 300 helots, one for each Spartan, and maybe more at the Battle of Plataea, there were seven helots for each Spartan, um, and these would have been fighting as light infantry. Now for the Persians, Herodotus has an awesome, awesome, awesome resource, and it's something I call the ship list. And I call it the ship list because there's a ship list in Homer, where Homer describes in great detail, this is of course the Iliad, the attack on Troy, um, all of the ships, who they belong to, how they were outfitted, and Herodotus does something similar, but he does it for the Persian army. And he talks about each national contingent. And this is an important thing. The Persians were this massively diverse and polyglot army. And they drew from a huge empire that stretched all the way to the Black Sea to modern Afghanistan and Pakistan. Wildly different ethno-linguistic groupings, all of whom have different military cultures, all have different kinds of equipment, different forms of armor, different kinds of weapons, mounted, unmounted and Herodotus goes through each one in detail. It's in book seven. I'm not certain which section it is, but if you Google around, it's certainly in my book, The Bronze Lie. I call out the specific ship list. Um, so please find that description in Herodotus and take your order of battle information from there. Based on Mike's research, I've gone ahead and made the Persian units as diverse as the rules allow. Other than cavalry, each type of unit represented in men of bronze is there. This gives the Persians decent melee troops as well as shooting power. For the Greeks, I decided to give them a significant amount of light units classed as siloi to represent the helots. This will give the Greek player some flexibility as they will not only be relying on the heavy hoplites. But that does leave one big question. How to represent the Spartan warriors? Are they super elite? Well, I know Mike has definite opinions on that, so I asked him. In most wargaming systems I've played, Spartans are called out and picked out as elite troops. Not really, right? So I, I will say this, it is accurate to say that Spartan heavy infantry may have been, in some circumstances, more disciplined and more organized than their wildly amateur counterparts in other Greek city-states. But to say that that eliteness, right, because the Spartans were not super warriors, they were in no sense professional, the way that modern professional soldiers are professional. Um, they were aristocratic dandies. They had a slave caste that was doing all of their agricultural and domestic work for them. And so they spent their time politicking and hunting and managing their estates and doing sports. By the way, we have no evidence that they trained for war, none. No one describes the Spartans in formation, drilling with weapons. We have some description of them practicing formations. We have some uh, description of them being able to march and deploy from column into line and those kinds of things in a, in a way that was better than other Greeks. But we don't have this notion of a super warrior. But were they more disciplined and organized than say, you know, these Plataean or Eritrean or, or you know, Ambrassia um, hoplites that they served alongside? Probably somewhat. Does that translate into such an advantage that they should have elite bonuses when you're trying to war game them on the uh, tabletop? I'd argue probably not. Okay, war gamers. Well, I'm gonna split the difference with Mike here. In this scenario, all of the Greek units are going to be classified as drilled hoplites, which in the Men of Bronze rules are average. And this includes the Spartans. I know, I know, heresy. But this is Mike's take on things. But I am going to give the Greeks a leader figure that represents Leonidas and his bodyguard. Leonidas can attach to any hoplite unit and make it elite as long as he is attached. Now, I think this is fair because in ancient warfare, a leader could have local effect by inspiring troops that he stands with. Plus, this you know gives some nice chrome to the scenario. Okay, next we want to hear from Mike about the famous terrain of Thermopylae. So Thermopylae is such a fascinating geological phenomenon. And in a future study, I hope to really address the physical geography of the site and how it changed over time. But the important features you have to remember about Thermopylae, and a lot of these are borne out both by recent um, 
uh, geological studies that bear out some of Herodotus's reporting. For example, his report that the East Gate was um, covered in marsh. Herodotus reports that by the East and West Gates, the path narrowed to the point where it was only wide enough for a single ox cart to get through. And that those choke points are, are a critical feature. The depth of the Malian Gulf to the north, which would have bounded the Greeks' right flank and the Persian left flank by water, so we have this very deep water to the north, and to the south of the Greek position, we have Mount Calidromo. It's sheer. It's a really sheer cliff, and would have been even more sheer uh, at the time of this battle. So what you have is this tiny little choke point, right, um, that uh, the Greeks have to cover. with, a, And we have the Phokian Wall cutting across the center of that pass where it's a little bit wider. And we know that that wall is high enough to have a gate because Herodotus describes it that way. Um, so we know that maybe you only need about 30, 35 hoplites to cover that span. So that's very important. The next thing that people trying to reconstruct the terrain of Thermopylae should be cognizant of is the description that Herodotus provides us is that there's the Anopaea path, the single path going across the saddle of Mount Calidromo to get behind the east gate to attack the Spartans from the rear. It's just not true. Bring up Mount Calidromo on Google Earth and take a look and you will see that there are many paths up and across um, Calidromo. The Anopaia path is ultimately the, ones that the, the one that the immortals chose to take, but there are many. So I encourage people that are trying to reconstruct the path around the saddle of Calidromo to get into the rear of the Greek position to go up on Google Earth, pull that up, and look at the paths that are manifestly obvious in the satellite imagery, and look at the ruins potentially of Byzantine and medieval walls um, that may give you an indication of ancient blocking positions as well. Here's the map that I came up with based on Mike's comments. Originally, I really wasn't sure he was going to give me any new information, but his observation about there being more than one path around Mount Kaliodromos was interesting. So I've added two paths, which should force the Greeks to either commit more troops to defend the paths or spread out what they have. In looking at Google Earth, I have also made all of the terrain south of Mount Calidromos rough terrain. This makes sticking to the paths a key if the Persians want to get around the small hill quickly. Okay, well that just about covers everything. So here's a final thought from Mike about the scenario. What would I hope a gamer would take away from Wargaming, Thermopylae, from the story I've told it? Um, is I hope that it would break them out of this mythic conception. Um, I hope it would break these really, in my opinion, toxic ideas um, that have been spread about this battle, that it was an East versus West conflict, that it was between the barbarous Persians and the noble Greeks, that it was lopsided, um, ridiculously lopsided. The truth is that both sides um, had tremendous advantages. What I would want people to see is that this was a battle fought with two solid strategic plans pursued by two able commanders, um, both who used the advantages they had uh, to the best of their ability, and that the best man won. Hey, so I hope that helped you see how I write scenarios a little bit, and also understanding Mike's take on this battle. So please go download the scenario for free. We used Men of Bronze for the land game and Greek Fleets at Sea for the naval game. We have a review of Greek Fleets at Sea on the channel. There's one of Men of Bronze coming. And by the way, it's a modified Men of Bronze rules, but we want you to check it out. And finally, just a big thank you for, for watching and being part of this channel as we continue to kind of grow and develop and find out what videos work and what you guys want to see. We got a lot of great things coming, including some stuff about what's on the table. If you can figure that out, it's coming in November, so check it out. Um, so please keep watching. Please tell us what you want to see. We want to keep growing and developing the channel as we kind of figure out how to make these videos in the midst of our busy lives here. So thanks a lot. We'll see you next time.